Uh, so I had a hard time coming up with a pithy sermon title for today's message, and you know how much I love my sermon titles. It was almost lunchtime on Wednesday, and I was being particularly stubborn about needing to nail it down before leaving my computer. And Connie poked her head into my study, asked what the theme was, and then just replied so simply, well, why don't you call it No Hometown Advantage? Brilliant. This woman is clever. But then came the hard part, figuring out what hometown advantage means. I mean, I've, I've heard it before. I live with someone who lives and breathes sports. So I know I've heard it, but does, is there any tangible advantage? Is this a, a real thing when someone plays at home? Occasionally, yes, occasionally. For example, in baseball, I know, you can just go if you want, it's fine. I'm sorry. In baseball, the home team bats last, which is an advantage when you're going into the ninth and you're down by a run or two. The factors, however, that suggest a hometown advantage are more often psychological in nature and thus difficult to measure. I um, turn to Wikipedia, as you do, uh, that endless source of corporate knowledge, and it describes hometown advantage as the psychological effects that supportive fans have on the competitors or the referees. Also the psychological or even physiological advantage of playing near home in familiar environments. I actually have to research these things, folks. Uh, when a team plays in its hometown, the players sleep in their own beds, not a hotel, and they count on the unwavering support from locals and fans attending the game, sporting the merch, and cheering them on. So it really can bolster one's confidence. It's definitely a psychological advantage. That is, unless you're Jesus. So Mark tells us, now I'm back in my territory, so I'm much more comfortable. Mark tells us that Jesus has come home for a visit. He's been on quite an adventure so far, preaching and teaching with awe-inspiring authority, touching and healing, exercising demons and calming storms on the sea. He left his small town life behind him and he cast out into ministry to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And he's been out on the road for a while now, so maybe he was just a little bit homesick. It would feel good to get a bowl of his mama's soup in his belly, catch up with his chums, his brothers and sisters, share his incredible stories of ministry and liberation and teaching with the neighbors and the shopkeepers. Just wait till they hear about the skirmishes he's had with the Pharisees. Yes, it was time to head back to Nazareth to fill up on that hometown vibe, to sleep in his old bed, perhaps. And word spread fast. Jesus had come home. We don't know what day of the week he got there, but we know that by the Sabbath, he had agreed to speak at their synagogue, where he grew up, learning and worshiping alongside of all of them. How exciting. I can imagine the members of the village chatting and gossiping and reminiscing with one another as they prepared for Sabbath worship, reminding one another to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt. Look, even if he's not that good of a speaker, we need to encourage him because he's just getting started and he's Mary's boy. Yes, well, I've heard some wild stories about him from my cousin who just came back from the Decapolis. Someone else says, hush, never mind your idle gossip. Let's give him a fair shake. I hope he doesn't preach too long, says someone else. I've left my clothes out on the line and it looks like it might rain. So as they wait for worship to begin that day, I can picture them all sort of squirming in their pews, craning their neck to see, make sure they have a good view of the pulpit. The rabbi gets up and very formally introduces the guest preacher. Our very own Jesus is with us today, Mary's boy. And he even brought with him a few friends. Welcome, visitors. The room went so quiet you could hear a pin drop. They think 
They're waiting for the familiar big brother of James and Joseph, Judas, Simon, and their sisters. They think they're waiting for the boy who knows how to make the best shelves in town. They think they're waiting for the obedient son of Mary. And naturally, they're prepared to excuse the shortcomings of someone safe and familiar who's from where they live and who's known by all of them. After all, they watched him grow up. They're pretty sure they know Jesus. And let's pause here, right? Because I get it. Have you honestly ever tried to go back to the place from which you came, where you grew up, among people much older than you, people who knew you as a child or an adolescent? Have you tried to go back to that place and assert yourself, establish yourself? It's not easy. I've preached in one of the congregations I grew up with or grew up in and in the pews were former teachers or music adjudicators, young high school love interests in attendance. This is not comfortable. It does not feel good. You know what I mean? Uh, Collectively, they just know way too much about you for anything you say to sound remotely credible, at least to yourself. It's uh, a vulnerable feeling. Like you can't get away with hiding your truest self behind a veil of professionalism. Not, not when your hometown folks are there and, and they were eyewitnesses to your childhood uh, nose-picking face. Uh, your awkward, pubescent body changes and your adolescent attitude. They still chuckle about that time you spit up on the minister at your baptism. Uh, They still lightheartedly chastise you for crashing into one of the ladies carrying a tray of cookies during fellowship time. And they remind you all too often about getting caught necking in the bell tower when you were supposed to be at youth group. (laughs) Whoa, that landed for a few of you. (laughs) It was just, just, I just made it up. These stories, they're all true for uh, stories of growing from infancy to adulthood. And these aspects of growing up were true for Jesus too. Newsflash, just because he was the son of God didn't mean that he skipped puberty. So when he returns to his hometown, that's all they see. Mary's boy. They see Mary's boy all grown up now off to explore the world, to teach and even preach. So when he starts actually teaching, teaching them in the synagogue that day, speaking with power and authority, Mark says they were astounded. But not in the same way that those who saw the garrison demoniac cleansed, not in the same way the crowd saw the woman with the hemorrhage healed or Jairus' daughter raised from the dead, more like gobsmacked at this kid, this local boy, would have the audacity to speak to them in this way with this much authority. Mark tells us that their patronizing hearts turned incredulous real fast. Mark writes, on the Sabbath, he began to teach, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother to James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here as well with us? And they took offense at him. In its breezy style, Eugene Peterson's translation in the message, uh, he probably gets Mark's intention right. Because the townsfolk, he writes, didn't, or the the townsfolk rather, think they know who Jesus is. And they end up asking disdainfully, who does he think he is? Here's the rub. Because whatever is behind their shock and skepticism, 
they refuse to acknowledge him and who he is. And this somehow seems to limit Jesus' own power. Did you catch that? I'm not sure if you caught it when Charlene was reading it. Listen again to what happens after Jesus finishes his sermon. Mark says, Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their own hometown and among their own kin and in their house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. Now it was Jesus' turn to be amazed, but this time at their complete and utter unbelief. Consider that just the chapter before, someone's faith was so powerful that power went out of Jesus without him even recognizing. And yet here in his hometown, no powerful deed could be done. It wouldn't matter if Jesus raised the dead right in front of them. They wouldn't believe it. He could do no deed of power here. So what's going on? And frankly... Why does this scene make me so uncomfortable? It's kind of embarrassing. I mean, come on, Jesus. These are the people to impress. Why would Mark include such a story? Why not clean it up a little bit? Make it slightly less humiliating? Why didn't the monks just leave out this line later in their work of transcribing the scriptures? It's really quite unflattering. I certainly wouldn't want to draw any attention to it at Bible study or choose to preach on it in front of a few hundred people. After some reflection, I think we find this kind of thing troubling and we just gloss right over it when we read the scriptures. I think we find this kind of thing troubling because we have been schooled to think, to defend and count on the fact that God doesn't need us, that God's ability to be God is in no way inhibited by our faith or lack thereof, and that indeed what I believe or think or do matters not even a little bit when it comes to God accomplishing God's purposes. That is a pretty core or fundamental reformed belief, and I am not messing with it. I mean, one of the central elements of the doctrine of justification by grace through faith, is that it is all up to God. God is the primary mover. God is the one who justifies. Salvation is by God's grace alone, not by our works. Our faith is simply an awareness of a a trust in what God has done. So yes, absolutely, I am not mucking with that today. So when So then why, rather, could no deeds of power be performed by Jesus that day? Have you ever stopped to wonder? Well, what if what's at stake here isn't a matter of God's ultimate purposes or our eternal destinies? I wonder if what Mark is simply inviting us to contemplate is the possibility that we actually do have something to do that we have an important role to play in the manifestation of the kingdom. To say it another way, this story isn't really about salvation. It's It's about the part each one of us has to play in sensing and experiencing and making known God's will and God's work in the world, pointing to the power of God in Christ, pointing to the power and will of the Holy Spirit, testifying and bearing witness. Deeds, deeds of power or miracles, they're not these isolated events. They are actually interpreted events. If Jesus is not regarded to be capable of any healing, any healing that does happen won't be attributed to him. It's not that Jesus needed his family and friends in order to have sufficient power and authority to teach and heal, but their lack of faith played a part in what could be accomplished for the kingdom. Put it this way, rarely does apathy or skepticism 
give birth to healing, hope, growth, and life. So, what if we had been part of the hometown crowd? I wonder how we would have responded. I wonder if Jesus would be shocked by our unbelief or our apathy or our skepticism, stuck in our own interpretation of who Jesus is. We think we know who Jesus is. And we think we know what he's capable of and not capable of. So stuck that we're incapable of seeing the new thing happening right in front of our eyes. Or perhaps so stuck in our own beliefs about who we are and our own limitations that we can't imagine anything new happening in and through us either. Mark says that Jesus couldn't do any deeds of power that day. And it makes me wonder if in our own ways, in our own lives, if we are either encouraging or inhibiting God's deeds of power in our lives, in our households, in our communities, and in the world. I wonder if we may be resisting God's activity in and through our lives, choosing to hold on to old narratives, old memories, old beliefs, rather than opening ourselves up to the power of God before us. I wonder if there is some area, some regret we can't get over, some grudge we can't let go of, some hurt that has come to define us, some addiction that imprisons us, some anger that has taken hold of us, that we are having difficulty in trusting to God. Or is there some opportunity we feel God might be inviting us to, or some challenge God might be setting for us that we find difficult to embrace or entertain, clinging stubbornly to our own ideas about how the world works? These questions aren't about the quality of our salvation. They're about the character of our Christian life, our walk of discipleship. Do we really participate in this? Are we part of the action? Are we skeptical bystanders? One hour a week Christians. And I'm not talking about blind obedience or blind faith. I'm talking about having skin in the game. In Jesus' hometown, it mattered. It made a difference to the kingdom of God, how people received Jesus. Compare that to how he was received elsewhere and the deeds of power, the displays of kingdom grace and abundance that flowed when people were invested. In backwater Nazareth, the carpenter, the son of Mary, he had no hometown advantage. But the son of God The Son of God is Lord of all heaven and earth. Frankly, he doesn't need an advantage because the game is already won. In the empty tomb, Christ is already victorious. But that shouldn't mean that we just kick back. Right after the flop in Nazareth, let's call it what it was, Right after the flop in Nazareth, Jesus sends his disciples out to teach and heal and sow seeds of the kingdom. And the results of this actually aren't recorded until much later. You have to read forward to verse 30. There, Mark writes that the apostles gathered around Jesus. Picture them breathless. And they told Jesus all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves. And have a rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And we know how important that was to Jesus. It tells us something about their success. When you are in the game, when you're committed to being a beacon of God's grace, a living, breathing outpost of the kingdom of God, you're going to see and you're going to participate in deeds of power all over the place. So much so that Jesus himself 
might have to remind you to hit the locker room for a bit, have a rest, and a snack. The game is won, but stay focused, stay in, and stay alert. Don't let a disheartening experience, like Nazareth, get you down. Don't let an old narrative hold you hostage. Don't let outdated beliefs hold you back from seeing what God and Christ is doing in the world in the power of the Holy Spirit, around you and in you and through you. That is way more than just a psychological advantage. That's a spiritual victory. So get out there and play the game. Go get them, Tiger. To God be all the glory. Amen.